This is Pod Populi, podcast for the people. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. Hi again, everyone. It's Brian Howie. Welcome to the Great Love Debate, the world's number one dating and relationship podcast. Since 2015, I am here in the very fine studios of Pod Populi, podcast for the people. I'm at the one in Palm Beach Gardens. I don't get here very much. It is, um, I recorded last week, as I told you guys, from Scottsdale, and it was 1,000 degrees. This is 5,000 degrees. This is so, give me the dry heat. This is terrible. All you uh, Southern people who are like, oh, no, it's not that hot. It's really hot. Um couple quick things before I get into what I want to get into and who I want to get into it with. You guys have been asking me when the new batch of live uh, tour shows are going to be on sale. They might even be on the website by the time you listen to this. We've got City Winery in New York City, uh, Good Nights Comedy Club in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, right here in Florida, Boca, the Boca Black Box uh, Center for the Arts, and uh, the Tempe Improv in Tempe. Those, sorry, I've been stalling. I have just been on the road too much. I used to do like 150 live shows a year. It's been nine years. I don't. I'm not going to do that many anymore. But I do the ones that um, appeal to me, and do the ones that I'm contractually obligated to do, and do the ones that you were really like. Come to Boston. So I come to Boston. And I do the shows. So those will be on sale shortly. Um, about a year ago. I did a show that, that I sort of addressed why I care about quote unquote, this stuff so much, why I eight years into this podcast and nine years into our live tour, I still want to talk about this stuff. And so I really sort of laid out why it, um, appealed to me, uh, emotionally, intellectually, uh, just on a lot of levels. I, I just feel like this is the one thing, love, dating, relationships, that everybody has experience with, everybody has an anecdote on, everybody has an opinion on, everybody has pain from. It's the one thing that you can grab any people from anywhere in the world and have a conversation, and that conversation should be engaging to everybody involved in that conversation. And so I sort of laid out, because somebody had asked me at one of our shows, why do you care so much about this stuff? But that answering that question um, really sort of only brought it down to about 5,000 feet. I wanted to know what this stuff is. I wanted to know what it is we care about. And I want to know why we care about what that is. So I brought in a pro. <laughs> She's laughing. She's like, I'm a pro. Because she is sort of privately and publicly uh, dealt with a lot of this stuff. And she has a very popular podcast that gets into this stuff and a whole lot more. Uh, you may have seen her on um, Celebrity Rehab with our old friend, Dr. Drew, back in the day. Uh, you might have seen her on Millionaire Matchmaker with our not-so-good friend, Patty Stanger, back in the day. <laughs> That's another podcast for another time. Um, she's the host of the Misunderstood podcast. I'm not sure how misunderstood she is, but we'll get to the bottom of that. Rachel, you can tell. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. So when somebody says... You obviously, uh, like I said, publicly and privately have been like, I care too much or I care so much or I really need this in my life. What is it that we need besides the primal companionship? We always say that we're wired to be with another person. It's more than a physical thing. It is an emotional, chemical thing that we feel, really feel the need to be in a relationship well, I think it's different for every person. Some people derive credibility from it. Um, some people, listen, some people don't love to be alone, but they just want the physical intimacy sometimes right. and then want to separate completely after that. So I think for everyone, it's very different and everyone has their own version of what means something to them or why it's so important to them, but it's the way they connect with other people for sure. And to me, for me personally, my relationships for a long time was, and I would get myself in trouble this way, I think, and I've dealt with it a lot, but like I derived my credibility by who I was with. And if that person uh, everyone wanted to know them, but they wanted to be with me. That made me feel loved and worthy. I mean, I think everyone's relationship- If they're is, somebody, I'm somebody. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that derived a lot from my childhood and from, you know, things that I went through very early on and feeling the need to, to be loved meant I was worthy, you know? So that's my psychological issue with being in relationships. But I'm 48 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm still single. Mm -hmm. I believe in monogamy. Well, it's only four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, I believe in love. I believe in getting married. I would love to have a family. I want a witness to my life, mm -hmm. but it's really hard to find that. 
and I'm a shredder. I'm not great at it. So, right. so you know, it's something I'm still you striving know, for. It's really hard to find that. But, you know, as we say, the juice is worth the squeeze on some level. It mm-hmm. should be hard to find that. Yeah. We make it hard to find that sometimes. We make it hard to keep that. We make it hard to recognize that. We do all yeah. of these things. But that was a really good point you brought up at the beginning. I need, because I lack self-esteem or I don't trust the love I was given from other people or I don't love myself, that somehow we need the validation not from just this person, but from the people who see me with that person. That really has a lot of layers to it that actually make total sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it makes sense. It's what I've been dealing with my whole life, I think. It's gotten me in a lot of trouble, but it's also made me understand, you know, I suffered from love addiction. That's what I was on celebrity rehab from Mm -hmm. um, dealing with. And I used to go on tour with Dr. Drew on all sorts of shows um, to talk about the validity of it because some people don't believe in it. And I believe that it, you're, Problems with love addiction is what stems into a lot of tangible addictions Mm -hmm. like drugs, alcohol. Um, And people don't see how there's a correlation, but there really is. And it was very interesting to me to find out about it and then to teach others about it. Well, I mean, I think every addiction of any kind comes from a hole or an emotional need that you're trying to fill. Yeah. I knew somebody who had a problem with alcohol and he quit that and he became a sex addict. Of course. And- I've never seen anybody struggle with such uh, self-loathing and hatred as with the sex addict. He's just like, I am ruining my entire life for these little sort of 30 second bursts of pleasure. And the whole time it was, I'm like, go back to drinking. Like it's really, really hard. Love addiction. Yeah. A lot of people probably say it's, um, it's a made up term or whatever. It's a fake term. But if you are addicted on an an emotional level to this need to feel connected, bonded, validated, any of those things, it's as real as anything else. And it can be hard for people to um, function in their job, in their other relationships, in their parenting, whatever it is for them, if they get so enmeshed in someone else that is probably wrong for them. And they tend to have a bad picker. They tend to um, replace um, love for intensity. You know, they're looking for the ups and downs. They're looking for this toxic thing. And it becomes so overwhelming, they cannot function as a person. Right. And they're picking the wrong people that make their lives unlivable in some ways. And then, you know, people get out of a relationship and they treat it like a game of musical chairs and they Mm -hmm. better find a seat as quickly as possible because they are floating without this life raft of both a connection and the validation that you talked about. Yeah. And not only that, when they get out of a relationship, it takes all their self value away. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of these people that struggle with love addiction, um, they cannot get up easy. You know, they cannot recover from losing this other person because that person's uh, took all their happiness and all their worth. And that that is the most debilitating for a lot of people as well. Where where are you from in real life? Where'd you grow up? Anchorage, Alaska is where I was born. I lived there till I was five and then I grew up in New York City. Okay. That's wild. Well, that's a transition. Yeah. Um, you know, New York City is an interesting place. You know, I'm from New York. A lot of the listeners are from New York. You can be what I call a uh, a bubble in a waterfall where there's all this energy around you and you sort of can float through an existence fairly isolated and fairly lone. Mm. And you, you, you really do have to try hard to connect there. It is a little bit cold. It is a little bit distant. Did you feel good about yourself at an early age? When did you, and you're obviously uh, beautiful. When did that kick in? Well, I mean, (laughs) I don't think physical, you know, what you look like physically really has a lot to do with women's self-esteem. No, but it gives you opportunities. It does give you opportunities. And by the way, you know, I used to run nightclubs for a living in Mm -hmm. Vegas, New York, the Hamptons, um, St. Bart's, whatever. And I can tell you that the heavier, unattractive women were the ones with the most self-esteem. They'd be getting up on, on tables dancing and they would go home with men at night. The models who were hungry, who were mean, who didn't smile, they were the ones that the guys wanted to meet, but they were not the ones that the guys fucked at the end of the night right. or, you know, even got their number because they were just annoying, yeah. you know, and the fun girls who just didn't care. Cause you're getting something back yeah, from them. You're yeah. getting energy back from them. Yeah. 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 So anyways, to get back on what I was saying, um, being in New York, you know, I was just talking to somebody about this today. The housewives of New York, none of them are married. All the other franchises, a lot of the women are married. New York is the hardest place, in my opinion. And Mm -hmm. I've lived almost everywhere Mm -hmm. from 
LA to New York, um, it's a really hard place to find people. And you really can be, and I learned this from working in the nightclub industry, you could be surrounded by people, but feel so alone. And yeah. I've suffered from that for a long time, but it's also because I have really high standards. Fun funnily enough, I, I had interviewed um, Mama June. Do you mm -hmm. know who that is? Yes. Do you remember her? Yeah, okay. Yeah. She just got remarried. She just got married. Mm -hmm. Now, I literally was coming up with the questions for her and a legitimate question I had was give me your tips on finding love and getting married because mm -hmm. I can't get myself married even if I threw myself at someone and someone was like you cannot ask her that that's ridiculous because she's picking someone who has like a meth habit and no teeth and right a, but you she's could, married. A, you can have a hot... Both Menendez brothers are married. Are they? Yeah. Oh, in Caribbean? <laughs> they're kind of hot. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, you could say I have a high standard, but are you making it because I have a high standard Then it's not about that? You're like moving the bullseye out of range so you don't have to deal with it. Maybe. You brought up Millionaire Matchmaker. When Patty's done this show, she mm -hmm. always goes, that there's no good men. There's no good men. Everyone wants to blame the city they're in, the people they're in, whatever, or I'm too busy or I'm picky or whatever, because they don't want to take ownership of there are opportunities and possibilities and people right in front of you who you probably could date. And it's scary to you to go down that road. Probably. I'm not someone who's easy to get to know, which is my fault. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of boundaries around me. I'm somewhat of a recluse. I don't like to, I mean, I love my home here in Florida. Mm -hmm. I don't like to leave. I have a beautiful home. I love my dogs. I have an 11 year old. Um, I, I don't meet people out at bars. Mm -hmm. I just would never do that. I don't, uh, I, I do a lot of online dating. Um, I, you know, it's just, it's interesting to me being on Millionaire Matchmaker, by the way, we could talk about that in a second, but you know, I try so hard to meet someone. I really do. But I probably, to answer your question, don't go above and beyond to pick the people that I really could meet because I, it's not that I find something wrong with them. It's just that I cut it off way too soon. As Patty labeled me, I'm a shredder right. and I'm not good at giving people a chance. And I've interviewed somebody who was on the net, uh, hosted the Netflix series, Jewish Matchmaking. Um, she was the Jewish matchmaker, mm -hmm. Aliza Ben Shalom, a wonderful woman. And she was like, listen, you have to give people a chance. You don't know anybody after the first date. You don't know this person. And my problem is I will meet someone and I can immediately know if they're going to be a boyfriend to me, you know, if we're going to be in a relationship. And that's my problem. And I will get into a relationship with someone for three years and not date anyone else. But like, I don't. I'm like, I know this person so well. They know me. They make me feel good. That's like a red flag. I know now not to do that. Do you say Google me or don't? I never say Google me. They usually have. Does it if, help? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> if they haven't, I always have that. And if, if they haven't and I like them, there's a lot of anxiety that goes on with, oh, how am I going to tell them this? Or how are they going to find out? Right. Um, there are plenty of times, even as of late, that, people before they get into even meeting me in person, they will say, just so you know, I know who you are. And I have no problem with it. I think you've been through a lot. I think mm -hmm. you're amazing. I'm so excited to meet you. And then there are people that when they find out who I am, and this happened uh, last year, someone said, I went out on two dates with them. And then I spoke to them on the phone and they said, uh, you owe me an apology. I can't believe how you have not been transparent with me. And I said, for what? And they said, you didn't tell me who you were. And I said, I don't even know what that means. I mean, obviously I know what it means, mm -hmm. but I couldn't believe they had the audacity to say that to me, that I owed them an apology. Right. And their thought was, you know, why should I find, find out from taking a flight and seeing the documentary Tiger and there you are? Mm -hmm. um, I should know that that's the girl I'm dating. And I thought to myself, but it's not like you disclosed everyone that you've had a relationship with in the past or your biggest regret maybe. It's not like you put that out on the table either. So what but, are we talking about? And not only that, you could make the argument and it'd be a valid argument. This is not what defines me. Yeah. And I'm trying to give you the things that are who I am right. now that you deal with. Right. If everybody had to be like, oh, here are the 10,000 important pieces of information. That's why when people make these little checklists, I like, I need this, this, and this. Well, those are five of 10,000 yeah. things you probably need. You don't know what's important to them. Right. So there's no reason for you to volunteer it. Right. But it's probably something that somebody, no matter what, because it's relatively interesting or really interesting, depending on who you are, they're going to have questions about, do you bring it up over the edamame? Like, when do you first say, oh, it's by really the way? It's really hard to know. And, they, and when they do know, they do have a lot of questions, which, you know, it depends who the person is, but I really don't Keep feel- Keep listening. Stop Googling. You can do that after the show, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't feel um, the need 
to go into details unless it's somebody I know that I like or I want to spend more time with. And I feel it's important to let them know the basic facts, not of what happened, but of just, you know, um, how I kind of want to shape that conversation. Cause Mm -hmm. listen, it's like, you know, have you ever cheated on someone? Have you ever done something that you feel guilty about? And then the whole world knows. Imagine right. what that's like. And then you are defined by that forever. I mean, everyone makes mistakes in their life, but rarely are you defined by it unless you like go to prison for it and someone mm-hmm. can Google it or whatever. Right. You get to learn from your lessons, hopefully, and move on. But when something that big is the most talked about story, not just in your area, not just in the... in America in the world, and it's still brought up to this day. It's very, it is not easy. I Why do you that. say it's a mistake? Well, a mistake is I, I don't, I'm not somebody who would like to define myself as having affairs with people. So that is the part that was a mistake. You're the affair, you're the, you're with the married one. I was not the married one, correct. Right. But I mean, it was, I was the, the monster, so to speak, <laughs> uh, you know, the mistress is always the you monster. You were willing a participant in an adulterous situation. And, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, that's between them. Right. Um, it's not great. It's issue, messy. Yeah. And the issue was between the three of us, not the world, right? So Correct. that's also what was, it became something I got angry about when people would ask me, because I'm like, that's really none of your business. Yeah. That's my business. And, you know, I have never in my life cheated on someone I have been with. I mm-hmm. believe in monogamy and people don't think they are not like, well, well, why were they in that? What, you know, what caused that? And obviously he was with 15 other women, obviously, you know, I had met Did him. Did you a know time. that? I knew that he had been because I met him when I was dating Derek Jeter and Derek Jeter and I let him come stay at, well, Derek let him come stay at the apartment. Mm-hmm. And I knew that he wanted to meet a couple of my friends. And, you know, I, and I remember asking, um, Derek, had, didn't he just have a kid? Yeah. He was like, yeah, but that's not their relationship. So it was something I'm not going to talk to him about, but you know, I knew that there was, there was no issue there from years before. It's a complicated uh, subject. This is a complicated subject. I gotta take a quick break because we got to pay for dates with Derek Jeter and a whole lot more around here. I'm with (laughs) Rachel. You could tell we're talking about what it is that we love and why we love it. We will be back right after this. And we are back. So when you say now um, you want to be in this relationship, Mm -hmm. a relationship relationship. for 50 years, happily ever after. I do. I believe in that. We always say, but before you can define love, before you can find love, you need to define it. How do you define it? Um, How do I define love or how do I define, define what I want in a relationship? One thing at a time. Okay. First, how do you define love for you? Um, love would be something that is unconditional, that you really have no judgments about, um, and you really care about that person or that thing's feeling, well-being, sometimes more than your own, and you look to always protect that person, and you look, almost glaze over a lot of uh, things that are bad. For example, I love my dogs. I love my daughter. Um, I love some of my daughter's friends. I mm-hmm. think they're just incredible. You know, I, there are some people that I don't even know that well. I love their personality or their energy. I really care about these people who maybe are not my best friends, but right. I just love who they are. Um, and then there've been relationships that I, you know, I love that person. Right. Um, so that to me is love, but that is different maybe than what I want in a relationship. You bring up the unconditional thing and the judgment thing. Is that because that's really important to you get that back in return based on that? Is there some guilt in that? No, no, not at all. I just think that what makes relationships tough is that, you know, it could be so nice in the honeymoon phase for a little bit, but then it gets really toxic almost sometimes. Mm -hmm. You might love someone, but then pick out um, all their negative things that bother you, you know, and give them a hard time and nitpick on stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that's what makes a relationship difficult. So when you really love someone, I think you look over a lot of that stuff. Cause you're just like, 
I love them. Like my daughter, she could be a total bitch half the time. Yeah. You know, she's 11. She's going 11. Until on, she's 13. Yeah. But more than half the time. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it, she's, you know, can be awful. Yeah. But I love her. So I have to laugh it off. I get mad. But then that anger goes away in seconds. Whereas if I'm in a relationship, mm -hmm. I can hold on to that. I can really let that fester. And then I want to make them pay because they've hurt me. And, you know, it's yeah. all Yeah. Well, one of, of the things that's going to be easier for you in your 40s and 50s, it's, it might be the pool isn't quite as big as during our nightclub days back in the day. Mm -hmm. But when you are in a relationship or you were married in your twenties and thirties, at some point you go from husband, wife to mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And that is a completely different dynamic in the thing, which sometimes brings people apart as husband, wife. It just kills the bond of what got you together in the first place. Yeah. You're still a mom, but when you get into it in your forties and fifties or whatever, you are sort of adults over that hump of needing that or, or having that whatever. And you can be like, this is my shit and this is your shit. Can our shit go together and we can yeah. sort of make this work. I think that has a, has a good chance, you know, or better chance to work at that age. If you can find the person, because a lot of people, especially men, I'm set in my ways. This is the way I live my life. This is what I need. And, and a lot of times I think it, it, it's not the responsibility of the woman, but I think there's an opportunity for the woman to create an environment where his confidence can flourish in a way that he will change in whatever way she wants him to. Mm. And a lot of times it is harder for a woman in their forties because you don't need us as much. You can buy your own shit. You can do your own shit. So the, the need of a man has gone away a little, yeah. which makes him lose his hero uh, thing that he needs to play and all that kind of stuff. But if there's like, you know what, I believe you can enhance my life, my world, um, my family, I think then he's willing to do whatever you want him to do. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think if somebody is accretive to the situation, if they are an asset, so to speak, um, they make you better. Um, they believe in you. They love who you are. That is a better relationship than sometimes you get into in your twenties and early thirties when you don't even know who you are yet right. and you don't know what you're looking for. So I, the reason I think why I'm so picky at this part of my life is because I know who I am. If someone has any problems with something that's happened in my past, mm -hmm. because that comes up a lot, mm -hmm. um, that's not the person for me because no. I, I know right. who I am and I know the friends that I have, they love me for who I am. Right. And I was a person before I've been a person after. And I think, I think it's just really important to, like you said, find who you can be in a foxhole with and they are going to be an asset to you and not let you down. And for me also, it's really important that I find a catcher. I am the man and the woman in my life in so many situations. I've been through my mother sending me to a awful therapeutic boarding school. Um, the one that Paris Hilton went to for a few months, I graduated from there. I was left at the school when I was 13 years old, um, and did not leave till I was almost 17. It was awful. You had to like dig a grave with a spoon. You had, to, I mean, horrible things Jesus. happened to you, um, there. And it's now been closed for abuse. I, ha you know, I've, uh, been engaged to someone who was killed while I, we were engaged. I, you know, no one got me through that, by, but myself, you know, I, um, was in a, awful scandal. And I had no one to turn to. My family and friends were like, that's a bad look. I don't know her. I had to get through that on my own. Um, I've had to figure out crisis management. And then my father, um, died of a cocaine overdose when I was 15 years old and I had to get through that. So I need to find a man who is going to be stronger than I know will be stronger than me in any situation. I can figure out anything. I can get a reservation anywhere. I can handle if someone hijacks mm -hmm. a plane, I feel like I've got it from mm -hmm. little to big. So I really want a person that I feel like can get me, even though I like to handle things, but I want to know that the guy's a little smarter. Will you let us handle some things? I can try. Will you play like I can't reach that on the shelf no, at Whole Foods? I'm not good at that. I'm I know. That's part that. of what you have to do. You have to give us an opportunity to be the boy. I know. You're right. And it's it's hard because you don't even need a ride anymore. You know? I know. You, Uber, you can fix your own shit. You can buy your own shit. I know. It's really hard for the men. I used to say for, for generations, we were shooting at a 10-foot basket. Now we're shooting at a 12 foot basket. Mm -hmm. We got to become a better shot, but you have to be aware that you raise the, the basket to get in your world because you simply need us less. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess so, but I appreciate men. I want to be able to lean on someone. Mm -hmm. I just have felt so disappointed, I guess, in the past that that might be my issue. But something really funny we're doing on my show is that we're trying to do things in a different way than what we've been trained to. And now in our forties, you know, we've gone a certain way and everyone has a type, right? You go on a, 
online dating site. You have a type. You fill out all these check marks. Mm -hmm. So my producer, Kelly, we've, we do this segment on Happy Hour. She's 45 years old. She tells me all her dating stories. And we decided, we announced that she is getting married New Year's Eve of 2024. And the only catch is we haven't found the guy. Manifesting. Yes. So we're manifesting it. We've put her on every dating site. We talk about every date she goes on. Now she's visiting me in Florida and we're mm -hmm. going to go out every night and look for different men, see what it's like online versus at bars. So we're doing the whole thing backwards to see if it works. Hey, I think that's got as good a shot to work as anything. Yes. Um, <laughs> can you be asked out at Target? Can if somebody I, just come up If I go here? to Target, sure. Well, whatever. I love uh, Target. Whole Foods. I love Target. Uh, I don't like Whole Foods. I like Publix. Okay. Publix. That's a very Florida thing. Um, you can be asked out like some stranger, like, hey, I just noticed the way you touch those melons. Would you like to go get uh, a drink sometime? Yeah. If I didn't think that was a cheesy line. Sure. <laughs> um, can I barbecue this? You yeah. know, whatever. Yes. You can. I a hundred percent. And probably I would like that guy more because I probably look like shit in the right. grocery store. I'm just being myself. And it takes some balls. And it does. It takes a lot we of We used to have to do that. Yeah, that's right. So not to do play uh, back in the day too much here, but you, you're not, me and you are not quite old enough to remember uh, the Studio 54 days. Mm. But the people who talk about those days talk about an era that that was the greatest time that ever yeah. was. The closest we have to that, and we, me and you kicked around the same sandbox back in the day for a while, <laughs> was those LA, Vegas, late 2000s, early aughts or whatever, mm -hmm. teens days. Yeah. Explain what that was like, because I try and tell people what that was like in that height of that nonsense before it all kind of shut down. The lines and the cash and the right. well, access. So I can tell you from the very beginning, because I grew up from when I was five in New York City. I went to an all-girls private school, Nightingale Bamford. Uh, my, my, uh, the circle that I grew up in, my boyfriend, my very first kiss when I was 12 was Jason Strauss. His best friend was Noah Tupperberg. They are the two the guys. Tau guys, right? They're Tau now, but they opened up Marquee. But before that, they started at Sweet 16. And when I dated Jason, when he was 12, he had a box, a tin box in his bedroom filled with cash. And it was because he was a promoter and he did all these things. He was the young kid that promoted all these parties and got kids to come in. And he promoted for Sweet 16. And he knew how to get people to places. So it started when we were young and it was a lot of cash. Then he went on to, you know, be a part of different nightclubs in New York and mm -hmm. different things. And then I moved to Vegas because of him. He was opening Tau. And that was a completely different experience in the way that he was now a real part owner of something big in a hotel. I came there um, maybe a month before it officially opened. And he taught me. He's like, listen. The women here are either strippers or waitresses. I don't trust any of them. I was, I had just quit my job at Bloomberg News. He knew that I kind of got it. And I was his friend for, you know, years since we were 12. Or actually, we knew each other since we were like six or seven. So um, he's like, if you come here, I will give you a job and you can help me figure this out. So I did. I went there and I stayed. I became known as a first lady in, in Vegas because we started dating again. But I, I was taught a level of customer service that actually now it doesn't even exist anymore because there's so much saturation of um, nightclubs. But at the time we were taught in a manner that no one knows this anymore. You had to do outreach every day. You had to go touch everyone in the city from the cab drivers to the concierge to let them know that Tao was opening or Tao was open and what the party was that week. You had to bring, the, the waitresses would get fired if they didn't bring in a guest list of 25 people. The host had to have 10 yep. um, things booked, tables booked. And it started- That'd be the right people. Yes. Well, it started with, because New York is much different than Vegas. Vegas is, they'll take anyone depending on what the price is. New York, even if you get in, there's another room you're never getting in. Mm -hmm. Vegas, you're in and but you can pay your But New York yeah. was crazy because you had to, I mean, I worked with a guy that made women stand on a scale to get in. I mean, that's how mean it was. <laughs> they would be like, you're fucking ugly. What are you doing here? They were mean there. But that's not how it was in Vegas. You could look like anything and come in. Right. And they loved it. They loved the money. They loved the people, the amount of right. like- people they could pack in. So we started at charging tables of $500 a table. Mm -hmm. And then when we really got into it on those $500, $500 tables, the minimums were 5,000. Yeah. And we were making on new year's, they were making over a million. And I was the person who cultivated, cultivated the first real bottle service customer that was spending 250,000, 400,000 a night. And that became somewhat of the norm. Yeah. But also we would teach, sorry, we would teach our, um, our, 
staff to know everything about them. You had to know their wives, their mistresses, what they liked to eat, what they, you know, what they did, where they were from. And then you could, they could not leave at the end of the night without writing a thank you note. So it was really done well. well. I mean, it kind of changed back in, back in the day, nineties, used to be able to go out with, you know, a couple hundred bucks and do whatever. Yeah. The table, the access, the bottle service, the VIP, it changed everything. Yeah. We used to have to bring out another guy who, so we had access to the girls and be like, you want to come with us? Yeah. You're buying. Yeah. And he knew his role and yeah. he'd be like, okay, I'm the guy with the black card. I will pay $20,000 and I get to hang out with you guys. Yeah. And he was getting something out of us and we were getting something out of him and sure. everybody's getting free drinks. And that just, it was like such a different world mm -hmm. that people would be like, oh, let's go to Vegas. I heard of this place called, you know, Pure. And it's like, you're nowhere unless you are spending five figures. Right, right. And when and I the worked- the pool's changed. Yeah. And when <laughs> I worked there, it was all cash. We were making right. almost um, $10,000 in cash a week. And they told us, do not put in more than 10000 into your uh, in deposit it, whatever, mm -hmm. because you will get flagged. So we put- cash under our bed for years. And it was only when Stevie D from Pure got, I don't know if he got arrested or got into some trouble with the IRS that they started to tax everybody. And that's Vegas. what happened to Studio 54, the yeah. bags of cash in the ceiling, like mm -hmm. ultimately, but the, the amount of money that people were making with the clipboards on the lines in those clubs. Or crazy, yeah. Or the appearance fees that people were getting to show up. Yeah. Like Kim and Paris and Lindsay and everybody yeah. got just to go sit in a booth for eight hours. Yep. It was insane, but the publicity and the, and the, the um, dollars that that would generate, it was worth it. You oh know? yeah. It was more than they were paying the DJs. Kim was getting $200,000 to come sit and talk to a guy named Jolo, mm -hmm. who now is, I don't know if you know who that is from Malaysia, that he was on mm -hmm. the run and all the stuff, but um, you know, we were paying a lot of, you know, sort of random celebrities at the time that mm -hmm. were just like in, in um, not social media, but in entertainment or pop news, right. Mm -hmm. To come be with these people. Yeah. So it was a very, you know, very interesting. Now, how do you find is love on your mind in that situation? Cause it's, it's such a chaotic thing. Getting a relationship there is sort of like you're taking yourself off the ride and the ride is such a uh, exhilarating period of, money and cash and people and all that kind of stuff that it's like trying to have a relationship during that time is hard. Well, it's interesting you ask that because I used to say all the time, I am in a room where 3000 new people come in four times a week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and we, there's no one that, that I ra that rarely throws me off. You know what I mean? And I was, Dating Jason, again, we had dated when we were younger, as I said, we decided to date again there. We ended up living together there. And to me, that was great because I was dating the owner of the club, my yeah. boss, whatever. And he, I knew him. I felt close to him and bonded with him. I also was highly aware of the trouble you can get in Vegas. Like I could have dated anyone that came in every weekend, any celebrity that came in. Mm -hmm. um, but that to me would have been... Uh, it would have taken me out of the game. I was so good at my job. So it was better for me to be in a relationship with someone there. And, but I, I did know, like, I did sort of have my eye out looking like, could I meet anyone else and fall in love and have someone almost like save me from this and get mm -hmm. me out of here? Cause I'm not going to live here forever. And I really didn't meet anyone like that. I mean, I met, that's where I met Derek Jeter for the first time, but I, mm -hmm. I didn't have any interest in dating him. We were just friends. And I, al I also found that I became very, um, someone everyone wanted to knew, know there because I was the gatekeeper and I was like their buddy and their Access, best friend. Yep. Yeah. So I knew everyone on a level where they trusted me, but if I ever crossed the line, that would have ruined it. But so they I wanted validation from knowing you in the way that you needed validation from knowing somebody else. It's a, it's kind yeah. of an icky, uh, circle of life that there, true, but that that's sort true. of true, yeah. you know? And it's tough if you're dating somebody who runs one of those empires for lack of a better term, just the amount of women that they have access to. That's well, why they always say Randy Gerber was so successful in, uh, as a nightclub guy and he ultimately married Cindy Crawford or whatever, cause he didn't get caught up in the nonsense. He had the one and that was it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Women would come to the front of the club every night and be like, I'm here to see Jason. And I'd be like, really? And my host would laugh with me. They'd be like, Rachel, stop. But uh, but also men were coming to the club, most, the most famous men yeah. to be like, I'm here to see Rachel. And like, we just had to have a trust. And he clearly was not going to do this under my nose while we were there. And we right. literally, when we were there, we were running a business. Like this was not us like trying to have sex. And, yeah. I mean, I had a rule that I had to go upstairs and party with everyone. The, 
the waitresses knew they had to put diet ginger ale in my champagne glass and they had to put water in my vodka um, glass. So the I illusion would, of party. Yeah, the illusion. And, and the whole thing was an illusion. Jason took his job seriously and yeah. definitely flirts because he knows, because he knew he had to. I definitely did as well, but I also had very good boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of the show. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to let you plug your podcast in a minute. But before we do, this is your first time on this podcast, we play something called worst date or first date. So you have to have to either give us the absolute worst date you've ever gone on or the absolute greatest first date you've ever gone on. Your choice. Oh, I wish you prepared me for this. Before Never. We throw um, you in the deep end. Okay. So I met Jim Norton on Bumble. Do you know him, the comedian? Yeah. And before I got together with him, he said that something was wrong with his elbow. And so he had become vegan or vegetarian. I don't know. He wasn't eating certain foods because he couldn't work out. So he was trying to slim down. This is what we were talking about on text before we met. Up. Okay. And then also I, I had, I owned a store at the time. So we were talking about clothing or whatever. And he, he said, Oh, uh, he asked me about my feet. Like if I was walking around in heels, I didn't think anything of it. He's like, well, how are your feet? Send me a picture of your feet. So I did. I didn't think anything of it. So anyways, I meet up with him at this like vegan restaurant, which by the way, even on my Bumble now, it's like I won't date Trumpers or vegans. Vegans. Like, That's it's super annoying. Reasonable. Today. So we go to this vegan restaurant. We're eating all this disgusting stuff, but I'm pretending I like it. And I finally, and I realize as we get through this, he has a foot fetish. Now, I don't know if you know this about Jim Norton, because I think it's kind of out well, there now. I do now. now. He has a major foot fetish. So like during dinner, he's like, can like I see Like a Quentin your- Tarantino yes, level foot like, fetish? can I see your feet? Yeah. You know, do you let people lick your toes? Blah, blah, And I'm like, we're at a vegan restaurant talking about feet. It was so uncomfortable, but he's so nice and so funny. I really like him. But I knew the date was going nowhere because as I t- told you earlier, I can spot within the first five minutes if I'm going to date this person. So here's where it gets really embarrassing. I kind of wanted to get out of there and leave. My store at the time was like a block away and I was riding my bike to- the store every day. It was like five blocks away and it was the middle of summer. So I'm like, listen, oh, and I had, and I had heels on. So I'm like, listen, uh, he's like, can I drive you home or get, put you in a cab and take you home? I'm like, actually I rode my bike. I'll, um, you know, I'll just, uh, walk over there. He's like, well, I'll walk you to your bike. So we go to the bike and we're standing from the bike kind of waiting to say goodbye. I'm like, this is my store, blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay, so where's your bike? I'm like, it's right here. He thought I meant a motorcycle. Meanwhile, it was a bicycle, bicycle. with a baby seat on the back because my daughter was like three or something. And I had to take my heels off and put flip-flops on. And then he's like, this is the greatest date I've ever had. This is so <laughs> random. And then like the Wizard of Oz, I had to bike away from him like mm-hmm. da, 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 with the baby seat behind me. He's like, no, I'm watching you bike off because mm-hmm. this is just too hilarious. And we never spoke again. He never called me. So at that point, I was like, wait, I want him to love me because I feel yeah. like such a loser. So he has to call me. I felt so unsexy taking off my heels, getting on this stupid bike when he thought I was that cool that I had a motorcycle. So that was a pretty da- bad Well, how are your feet? My feet look fantastic. <laughs> I used to know this guy who had a foot fetish and he subscribed to this magazine called Well Healed. Ooh. And he was like, he would go up to random people and it's like, what is that? It was like an eight and a half. Like <laughs> it was so weird. But part of me, some of these fetish people that I've met, they're into that more than I'm into anything. Yeah. And part of me is jealous. Like they, they have what they love and yes. they're passionate about it. So right. maybe we're the weirdos. Yes, I don't so know. I agree. All right. Tell everybody about your podcast and where to find you, please. It is called Misunderstood, M-I-S-S, Understood with Rachel Yucatel. You can find it on Apple, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts. I would love for you guys to tune in and listen. This was good. Thank you. Uh, As far as us, not just misunderstood, but this podcast too, please like, share, follow, and review this podcast. Your reviews mean a lot in the podcasting ecosystem. Uh, Shoot us an email, greatlovedebate at gmail.com. If you have questions, thoughts uh, for me, Rachel, or uh, you want to send us a picture of your feet, have at it. Uh, The aforementioned live tour schedule, the 10th season of the Great Love Debate World Tour. I don't know what's on there, but by the time this drops, there'll be some on sale. Go check that out because as always... At The Great Love Debate, we never stop making love. See you next time.